My name is Ryan, also known as Average Joe's Crypto. I'm joined with Mona Elisa. She is the founder of Enzyme Finance, and today we're going to be talking about Enzyme. So uh, I gave myself a little introduction about Mona. Why don't you introduce yourself? Give us a little background of who you are. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks. Um, good to be here. My name is uh, Mona. I've been um, in the DeFi space for about seven years now. Um, prior to that, I, I was in traditional finance. So I, I have a background managing money for nearly a decade at Goldman, uh, both on the market making side and, and the prop side uh, across asset class. And after that, I moved to the buy side managing money at a hedge fund uh, for four years. And then the last stint I did was kind of trying to launch my own hedge fund, which was an interesting experience. Um, it was a $20 million fund size uh, initially. And I was totally unprepared for the operational and administrative headwinds that come with running such a small fund. I had been completely shielded from them when I was uh, in my previous two places. Um, but it was a real eye, eye opener for me in terms of how inefficient the financial industry is today. Um, but it was also, um, you know, to look at the positive, um, what helped inspire Enzyme um, a few months after I shut it down. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, after shutting down the fund, that was about a year into it, I um, I got on to kind of uh, uh, some time out and uh, discovered crypto, uh, got really obsessed, got really interested by the power of smart contracts um, and took the view that the future of assets was digital. And if the future of assets is digital, um, I was thinking we can completely automate the operational and administrative side of asset management. And uh that set us on a path to to kind of uh, conceptualize Melon at the time, which was then later rebranded to Enzyme. And uh, Enzyme was decentralized in February 2019. I think it was the first DeFi protocol in history to become decentralized. But more on more importantly, it's been on the main net now for more than four years, and uh, it's uh, going uh, you know it's 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 going slowly but steadily. Awesome. That's all great. So to give our uh, listeners a little bit of background, so I wrote this report, uh, Enzyme On-Chain Asset Management, back in December of 2022. It basically just gives a brief synopsis of what the protocol is, what Enzyme is, what it does, stuff like that. So we're going to spend the rest of this call just kind of going through it. You're going to explain to all our viewers and myself more about how Enzyme works and stuff, and it's going to be a great learning session. So I guess... The first question I want to start with is, can you just kind of give an explanation of how Enzyme works? Obviously, you're, you gave the TradFi background. So now explain to me kind of how this whole Enzyme vert on-chain hedge fund kind of works. Yeah, so you can think of Enzyme as, as kind of um, an, the framework to, to manage your DeFi in asset management. So whether it's just a passive product, an active product, anything, it's highly configurable and highly customizable. So you can basically build any kind of product, a wallet, smart wallet, a fund, uh, an index, anything you need to build, and you can configure it and customize it any way you like. So the kind of parameters that you can play with are things like, you know, um, what is your what is okay? What is your token symbol? What is the denomination asset that you're going to be playing with? Um, do you want to charge any fees? Um, are what are those fees? Who do those fees go to? Do those fees need to be split to anyone? Um, what are the rules around investments um, into the fund? Is it even open to investments, or is it just something proprietary internal? Um, if it is open to investments, who's allowed to invest? Everyone? Just some people? Um, you know, is there a minimum ticket size? Is there a maximum ticket size? Is there, you know, are the fund shares transferable? Um, and then last but not least, and I think one of the most powerful parts of the protocol, you can configure um, permissions, smart contract enforced risk management permissions. So Enzyme is really unique as an asset management tool in DeFi because it has an on-chain knowledge of price. And I think there's no other protocol or tool out there today that has an on-chain knowledge of that. And because of that, we can build superior risk management tools that protect against misappropriation of assets through flash loan attacks, through you know selling an asset to yourself anonymously at the wrong price, or the hundreds of other different edge cases which you can misappropriate assets through in DeFi if you don't have the risk, the right risk management in place. Um, and all of these things again are smart contracts enforced. 
you configure them, you deploy them, and then um, you can just get going. Um, from a from a manager, from a trader perspective, you can delegate trading to different people with different permissions. And um, the nice thing about the management perspective is you have all of the DeFi protocols and assets integrated in one simple unified interface. So you don't need to keep switching screens to go from one DeFi protocol to the other. Um, and we um, automate the calculation of the PNL on chain. So it's always auditable, verifiable, and backed by on chain proofs. Awesome. Very interesting. Uh, as we as we might all know, the asset management industry in traditional finance is huge. And asset management was really starting to take off in the crypto space in like 2021. You had very popular CFI companies like Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi. But as we all know, they ended up kind of blowing up. They were kind of black boxes. You didn't know what was going on with customer funds. Can you kind of explain to me the difference between how Enzyme works and how it protects you from some of the risks that were exhibited in those uh, companies? Yeah, so I think like the really novel thing about Enzyme, um, there's this sort of three things. I think the first is that it enables investors to have self-custody at all time. So we've read, you know, a ton of headlines recently in the press about, I think the most recent one was Franklin Templeton to tokenizing its fund on Polygon. But, you know, that fund token, it doesn't give you any redemption rights. It's not a, you know, you're not in custody of your assets when you hold that fund token. Whereas if you hold an Enzyme Vault token, um, you basically can redeem that fund token anytime for the underlying assets. And I think that's a really powerful in the, first of all, if, you, if you're investing in crypto because you believe in the, in the um, value proposition of being able to hold your assets in self-custody, but also in this, in this kind of <laughs> age of uh, um, becoming unbanked, I mean, in the last 12 months, there's like, you know, depending on what nationality you are or what sector you're in, you know, a lot of uh, innocent standbyers have been unbanked just because, you know, you're not the right nationality or you're in the wrong sector um, in terms of your job. And that probably only increases from here. And so, you know, increasingly, you know, being able to have access to investment opportunities where you hold the underlying custody is important. So self-custody is one option. The second uh, one, one advantage, the second uh, advantage is that you completely eliminate counterparty risk because you're only ever interacting with DeFi technologies. So um, doesn't mean that you can't access liquidity in CeFi, but it definitely means that when you interact, you're settling autonomously in the same transaction and therefore there is no counterparty risk. And this should be something that after all the lessons we've learned from FTX, Celsius, et cetera, is extremely valuable. And the third thing is the transparency. You know, again, you touched on it, Celsius, Voyager, et cetera. We had no look through into those uh, portfolios, those uh, uh, companies. Um, investors here have access to the data in real time, on chain, at all times. And I think that um, the way we move forward from the events of the last 12 years, uh, 12 months, sorry, is, is uh, more transparency, more self-custody, and removing counterparty risk. So uh, DeFi enzyme is definitely part of the solution there. Yes, I definitely agree. I, I always stand by that, like DeFi's killer use case is like the transparency and that you can audit it in real time, and that's just not achievable in traditional finance. And it's really cool to see a protocol like Enzyme embrace that. So uh, moving on, we're going to move on to this to the next section of the report. So you kind of gave the background. Let's go a little bit more into how Enzyme works and specifically like what vaults are and, you know, can anyone use them? How do I create a vault? Stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, the protocol is completely permissionless. Anyone can use it. It's open source. You know, it's available for anyone to use. Um, we don't tell you how to set up a vault, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess one of the questions we get the most um, and actually probably one of the biggest hindrances to our adoption so far has been um, a lack of knowledge or information on how to nav navigate the kind of the regulatory environment for actively managed funds. Um, so passive is kind of relatively easy. Uh, there's a kind of school of thought that's developed that if the strategy is autonomous and passive and doesn't charge a performance fee, um, you can kind of run it in a way that's, you know, uh, you know, unregulated or avoiding regulation. 
However, with active management, there is a manager there who typically is known. And that's also like, you know, a point of failure. And that's, I think, why active management has never taken off. And, you know, we speak to a lot of managers who are afraid to launch, you know, put their name next to a strategy and then later get in trouble if they don't have. And so something that we've been thinking about recently as Avantgarde Finance, again, Enzyme is the protocol underneath. Avantgarde Finance has been thinking about how do we empower and enable those managers um, with kind of a lightweight regulatory solution on top or, you know, a compliance solution on top that they can confidently go ahead and launch their DeFi strategies without having to fear uh, the consequences. And that's, again, optional, not something that we enforce. And it obviously depends which jurisdiction you're in, what you want to do exactly, etc. Um, but hopefully that should help unlock some value uh, to people who are interested by it, want to use it, but can't figure out how to do it in a compliant way. Interesting. Very cool. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about like how exactly can I customize the vault in terms of like what other DeFi protocols I want to have it interact with? Uh, can I limit, you know, what users are allowed to deposit? Could you talk about more about that stuff? Yeah, totally. You can um, you can choose a denomination asset. And the purpose, the main purpose of that is, you know, your performance fee is calculated automatically again by the smart contracts against that denomination asset. So that's the main purpose of it. You can um, you can have an allowed list of who's allowed to invest. Again, you know, me coming from the traditional finance space, building DeFi, a large part of it for me was automation. Um, but a lot of the design behind it has institutional use case in mind because, you know, inevitably, I think it's we move in that direction. So a lot of the things or the tools, the, the, the configurations that you see when you're setting up in a vault um, lend themselves quite well to institutional use cases as well for, for that use case. So things we can do is, you know, determine who's allowed to invest, who's not allowed to invest. You can determine minimum, maximum investment size, you can talk about uh, fund share transferability. Uh, if the fund share is a token, uh, then, you know, obviously, you might want to have some restrictions depending on what, what the what the legal solution is behind it. Um, and then on the protocol side, you know, you can delegate trading to managers in your organization, or your investor can delegate trading to the fund owner. And you can build in rule sets like, you know, the manager is only allowed to interact with these assets only allowed to interact with these protocols, not allowed to interact with these protocols or these assets. Uh, you can also, again, this is the unique part, you can also build in um, price sensitive risk rules. So, you know, for example, I think this is probably one of the most powerful things you can say, well, if Ryan loses 5% in trading slippage over a seven day period, um, revoke permissions, because that's starting to look a little bit suspicious until you know, the higher kind of organization level, we have a chance to review and see why he has he lost 5%. Another angle is, uh, you know, a stop loss, like if you lose 15%, a lot of organizations and trading platforms and, um, you know, uh, multi strategy funds have these kind of stop losses in place so that, you know, you can prevent, you know, often traders can get a little bit um, lose discipline if they're losing money double up at the wrong time instead of you know just accepting that they were wrong and so you can build these things in really easily uh, they're enforceable at a smart contract level and if by doing the next trade you're going to breach any of those limits the trade will just get rejected and that's a very powerful tool in traditional finance you would need teams of five six operational people per investment professional to implement those rules um, and also they wouldn't be happening in real time because you'd only find out T plus two, T plus three when things settle. Um, so, you know, huge, huge margin for error. But more importantly, you're automating things, you're reducing your cost base um, and you're building, if you're building on kind of these kind of DeFi smart contract based technologies, you're also uh, paving the way for a much more scalable business model. Wow, very interesting. That, that, that stuff is all really cool, uh, especially, you know, compared to traditional finance. Like, I really like how you point out that, like, we can literally have smart contracts that enforce certain activities where in the TradFi tried world, you know, they might go do this and then you wouldn't find out until a couple of days, couple of days later. And then by then, who knows where the money is? Uh, one thing, one last thing I want to touch upon here. So let's say I want to, let's say I deploy some uh, Enzyme Vault that is going to take advantage of you know, depositing stable coins into Curve, let's say. Uh, that's the initial parameters I set up. And then, you know, a month later, I also want to change some parameters, allow me to also borrow stable coins 
from Abe, let's say. Uh, yeah. How would that work from a technical standpoint and more so like if I was a depositor in said vault, like would I be able to withdraw in time? Like how, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way that we built this um, is always thinking, okay, if you imagine that there are investors involved, how do we protect investors and how, we, how do we try and keep a trustless relationship between the manager and the end investor um, so that there's no need for any middleman to kind of bridge the trust between these two kind of um, stakeholders. And um, obviously there are lots of things like, the, you know, you can change in a fund rule set configuration that could potentially be negative to investors. So like a simple example, what you said isn't necessarily negative, um, but if you've only promised to do Curve and then suddenly you're doing Aave, you're breaking a promise, right? Um, and a more kind of a worse example would be if you if you promise to have a 1% management fee and then you increased it to 20%, um, your investors might not, you know, have the chance to opt out before it's too late. So the way we've um, designed things is that if the manager changes any rules in the fund, um, there is a cool down period by which investors um, to d to have seven days to react um, and redeem from from the vault uh, before they um, have to incur the new changes. Um, now, monitoring for the changes isn't super easy today, uh, but something that we're working on is um, adding alert notifications so that people can get these changes in real time. Awesome. I think that's a really important component of Enzyme, and it's yeah. definitely a great way to protect investors. So I definitely wanted to touch on that because I think it's one of the cool aspects. So we, we touched a lot about the protocol overview and kind of how it works. I want to start talking more about the uh, Enzyme's token. Uh, it's called MLN, obviously, for what it used to be uh, Melonport. Let's uh, bring that up on the thing. Uh, so the first token came out in 2017, pretty old. And then in 2019, there was a token migration. Can you, can you talk to me a little bit more about this migration and how it kind of fits into the larger scale of Enzyme? Yeah, I mean, that was... Uh, a long time ago, um, <laughs> the the original um, token contract, I guess, um, we hadn't really designed uh, the tokenomics when when uh, the, the contract was deployed. And I think um, that was one of the last things we did before deploying the, the protocol. And I think um, the, the general idea was that having a disinflation, uh, disinflationary uh, setup for, for Melon would be ideal. So most projects, they mint like an absolute amount, like a billion tokens, and then that's it for life. Um, whereas we minted a very small amount up front. I think it was 1.2 million, if I remember, or maybe 1.25 million. And then each year, um, the council had the right to mint 300,000 new tokens. So that's only possible after the migration. Um, 300,000 tokens per year, that's kind of like the budget. Um, if that doesn't get spent, the council then subsequently burns the balance. And um, actually for the last two years, it has been burning. Um, this year also, there will be a burn, although the number hasn't been confirmed because we're still finalizing accounts. Um, but yeah, so 300,000 a year is like the worst case scenario. Um, it's a fixed amount. And uh, actually, typically it's less than that because um, the remainder typically gets, um, gets burned. And maybe just worth noting that if somebody hasn't migrated, um yet it's still possible to migrate so uh, we still get requests um every now and then and uh, we're happy to to send updated instructions on how to migrate awesome very cool uh you kind of touched upon the enzyme council on that question can you tell me a little bit more about the enzyme council and how that works yeah so so the enzyme council is the governance body it's the dao uh, behind enzyme um so again <laughs> We were the first ones to decentralize and we took a slightly different path than what other DAOs later took. Um, but essentially what we did was um, we, we, we opted against a token holder governance structure um, because the many of the votes that the council have to vote on are fairly technical in nature. Uh, so upgrading the contracts, um, you know, making sure that the new contracts that we're proposing, for example, are not malicious contracts, that they're verified by the auditor, etc. These are really difficult things to verify if you're not technical with the tools we have today. So it was important for us that uh, security came first. And uh, so we opted for the majority of the council has to be tech 
technically skilled. Uh, so a lot of our council members are auditors. Uh, we have, uh, for example, Chain Security, G0, uh, Nick Munoz McDonald. We have um, uh, Paul Salisbury, who's a former uh, auditor, smart contract auditor until very recently, um, and many others. And, and this kind of gives us the ability to react quickly um, it prevents blind signing, um, which unfortunately I think is is a flaw of many DAOs because people have to vote on things they don't really have the skill set to vote on. Um, and it makes sure that the quality and the standards, the checking is is high. Interesting. So now how does does the council have like ownership over the existing vault contracts or can they do they have the ability to change yeah. that? How does that work? So they um, they. They cannot change the vault contracts. They can only propose an upgrade, um, but managers have to opt into an upgrade. Uh, so we cannot upgrade the protocol on behalf of others. We can only point uh, the official version, um, point towards the official version. Um, and if the council, enough of the council members vote for that official version, then that indicates that, um, you know, that indicates some level of confidence to people that uh, this is exact, this is indeed the official version. Yeah, definitely. I think that I think that's important that even though that there is this council that, you know, controls a lot of the protocol, they can't actually, you know, no, affect the, sorry protocol. to be clear, the council does not control the protocol. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm trying to get at. Is that the, you know, they, there's this council, but they can't actually control the existing logic of already existing vaults and stuff like exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh so kind of getting back to the uh MLN token, can you explain to me just kind of how it works within Enzyme protocol? Like what, what is it used for? Yeah, so uh, the token is a utility token. Uh, um, basically, there is a fee uh, that is paid by a usage fee that's paid by Enzyme Vaults. Um, it's very advantageous to pay that fee in MLN um, and it's paid to the network um, and eventually burned. Um, so yeah, it's a, uh, it's a utility token. Um, the council in theory have the right to change that in future. Um, and, uh, you know, the only ongoing discussion around that is whether all, um, users should pay the same fee or whether discounts should be given to larger participants, uh, over a certain AUM size, um, that hasn't been formalized, uh, in any way yet, but, before this bear market, we were starting to have some discussions um, on that because, you know, some of the players were were becoming pretty large and uh, even one of them exceeded 100 million. Um, and so it was becoming quite relevant and part of the discussion. Awesome. You started touching upon it at the end. So let's start talking more about the traction of uh, Enzyme and kind of the juicy details. So back, I believe it was in February, March of 2022, you guys had your Sulu V4 upgrade. Uh, just really quickly, just kind of explain what that brought to the protocol. Yeah, so um, the um, I lost my track of thought. Sorry, I was distracted with a message. The question was on traction, wasn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. just kind of about Sulu and how that kind of changed stuff. Yeah. Well, the Sulu was a really big one for us because the, the jump from V1 to V2 v, um, was, was massive. Um, I think, um, you know, the, anyone who remembers V1 will remember that it was uh, clunky. It was very, use, uh, the user experience was very difficult um, and there wasn't a lot you could do with it. It was slow, it was buggy. And um, by the time we started building V2, DeFi had actually become a thing. You know, when we built V1, I think the only DeFi protocols that existed were 0x and Maker. So we didn't have a lot to, you know, um, uh, we didn't have a lot of insight to what the future looked like in DeFi. V2 was almost like a complete overhaul um, where we redid a lot of the uh, architecture around it and it, it laid the foundation for a um, much more powerful protocol which could integrate many different types of DeFi protocols. It could enable things like um, uh, staking of your tokens, participating in governance, um, you know, uh, you know, dealing with derivatives, dealing with lending, borrowing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, each version since then has gone from strength to strength. Um, but I think like from V1 to V2 has been what was like the biggest jump. And in terms of the future, um, what's planned for the future, I think um, V5 is on the horizon. 
Um, V5, you know, solves a problem, I think, that a lot of users have raised uh, questions about, which is uh, that the asset universe currently is limited uh, to, you know, uh, um, which price feeds are available on Chainlink or derivative of those assets. Um, so we have an asset universe of about 300 assets and derivatives today, um, but there is always, people always want more. And so V5 architecturally will be able to um, allow uh, different types of assets to be added in different ways to price those assets. And actually uh, the fund administrator, the fund owner will be able, um, or some mutual third party will be able to select how a, diff a particular asset is valued. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, one thing I want to touch upon, you know, if you take a look at that chart, like the Sulu upgrade came out and Enzyme Soar, a very big increase and then obviously the bear market hit so it uniquely did not affect just enzyme but i do think it's very interesting how that despite the bear market you know if you take a look at some other statistics like the outstanding vaults and depositors they actually grew throughout the year so i think that's very promising and then so this report was written in december uh i think at the time like the latest you guys integrated with balancer i believe uh can you just touch a little bit more upon like what recent developments have happened since maybe December in terms of like integrations and stuff like that? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm doing this a little bit from memory, but I think we've done, yep. we, you know, we've really ramped up on the integrations. I think you can stake directly now through Kiln. Um, we have um, balancer pools. We have Uniswap V3. We've upgraded to Compound and Aave V3. Um, we have Aura, um, Convex, we're able to um, stake on governance, as I mentioned. Uh, so, so participate in governance from a vault. Um, and there's a lot more coming in the in the pipeline. I believe we're looking at Stakewise V3. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, a number of different DeFi protocols. All in all, I think we've probably got more than 20 DeFi integrations now. Um, and uh, we're also, in addition to those integrations, we're looking at a lot of people who have requested tools for automatic rebalancing. So we're looking at integrating tools like Gelato. Um, and um, yeah, I saw a couple of people asking about institutional adoption on the on the chat there. Um, and you know, another, that is a question we get a lot. We speak to a lot of institutional players. Another request that's been uh, interesting is whether it's possible to create a walled garden uh, for trading uh, where you kind of um, interact with counterparties, you know, um, and that is uh, definitely something that's going to be possible soon. Very cool. Uh, kind of building on all of that, like one thing I find very interesting about Enzyme is like this can be a tool for not just institutions, but could also be a tool for like native DeFi protocols and DAOs and stuff like that. Can you can you touch a little bit more upon like how a DAO can use Enzyme to you know manage their treasury or something like that? Yeah, sure. So um, I love this topic. So <laughs> um, basically, uh, I think there is literally no better tool than Enzyme to manage a DAO treasury out there today um, if you want to keep things trustless. Um, and the reason is that, uh, and also it helps you, min potentially helps you minimize legal risk and individual risk. So let me break that apart a little bit first. Let's talk about the trustless aspect first, okay? So um, anyone, any contract, individual or smart contract can own an enzyme vault. So it's pretty easy to imagine deploying um, an enzyme vault via Tally through a vote which leads to a transaction that deploys a vault that is owned by um, the Open Zeppelin governor contract or whatever your governance contract is. Then, you know, depositing into that vault is potentially um, can be bundled up in the same transaction. Once the funds are in the vault, remember the DAO still has full custody of those and that custody is represented by a token that's redeemable for the underlying assets. But now you can configure the vault such that you can delegate trading to one or more parties with very strict rules in place that enable um, things to be trustless. So there's no way for the person you've delegated to to take money out of the vault. There's no way for them to misappropriate funds through you know, engineering a flash loan attack or a series of high slippage trades against themselves or anything like that. 
And you can, at a very high degree, and granular degree, if you want to, control what they can and can't do, whilst also relieving yourself of the pressure of having to take everything to an on-chain vote. And I think that that is like the holy grail when it comes to maximizing efficiency and trustlessness. Because um, we've seen a lot of DAOs, like, you know, during the USDC DPEG, for example, um, I witnessed hundreds, of, well, maybe not hundreds, but quite a few conversation uh, in DAO kind of governance channels talking about what shall we do, what should we do, and nobody really could take a decision. And even if it goes to vote, we still have a seven day cool down period. And then, you know, and then we have to take it to an on-chain vote and blah, because that's what the governance process says. But actually, there is a much simpler way to do these things, which is delegate, um, entrust somebody, give them some powers, an expert, by the way, probably somebody who's more qualified to do it than your average token holder, and let them do it in a trustless way. So security and trustlessness is number one reason why I think a DAO, um, uh, is, this is suitable for DAO Treasury. Number two um, is transparency. So transparency, um, you know, being able to see in real time, in human readable terms, what your PNL is, uh, where what positions are held, and you know, having on-chain trustless reporting. Because still today, most DAOs, what they do is screenshot their safe at the end of the month, trust somebody to upload that data into a spreadsheet, and like build some kind of model around it, all using centralized, um, you know, data and or you know, kind of intermediaries who are transposing data. Uh, from one place to another. So, so many points of failure. Um, whereas on Enzyme, we're indexing the data. You don't have to trust us. You just have to trust the graph protocol and then we're matching it to an on-chain price. And so it's like literally trustless reporting. And then the third thing is um, we we are very active in, in DAO governance as a, as a company. And we have noted um, over the last few months a lot of increasing concerns about um, having individual signers. So a lot what a lot of people do is have um, a subcommittee of people that manage the safe. And there are some schools of thought that say that having um, having a safe uh, and single signers, for example, on a multi-sig or a MPC or whatever, introduces individual liability. And so by keeping the DAO as the owner of the vault and just delegating trading to somebody who um, has a license and has the ability to trade on behalf of the DAO, that is something that is um, potentially a lot safer um, in terms of protecting individuals. Wow, very cool, uh, very interesting stuff, especially with the DAOs. I, I definitely think Enzyme is a really cool tool that I think we'll see over time more DAOs start incorporating. Uh, the, next, the next topic I wanna kind of touch upon is, so I like to think of the asset management space in crypto as active versus passive. So I think a lot of traction so far in crypto and in DeFi has been more the passive stuff, kind of stuff like Yearn Finance and, you know, other protocols like Index Coop, which, you know, they kind of just automate everything away. And when I was first researching Enzyme, and I didn't realize this, I think until actually you pointed out to me is that, you know, you can do passive strategies on top of uh, Enzyme through the Enzyme SDK. Do you want to just kind of touch a little bit more upon like the Enzyme SDK maybe or you know, how a passive strategy could work? Um, yeah, sure. So the SDK is actually something that we're um, making really, really great progress on right now. It's probably one of the next features to be released um, in terms of like a heightened version of, of the last one. But the SDK basically um, enables people to build automated strategies or interfaces on top of Enzyme in a much easier way. So it just gives you the building blocks. You don't, um, and, and, and very easy tools to do that. Um, and yeah, I think that's something that people, um, maybe not enough people aren't aware of, but some people are aware of, and that's why we've had, you know, uh, projects like Nexus Mutual build, you know, bridge their protocol to Enzyme instead of building out a whole asset management component themselves, easy building blocks. We've had, um, Unslashed Finance did that a few, a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more use cases now, um, projects building on top of Enzyme because of the SDK it makes their life easier. Um, also in a bear market, nobody really wants to take on um, the infrastructure operational costs of setting up and maintaining a protocol. I mean, deploying a protocol is easy, like Enzyme, but maintaining it is a lot of work and it's very expensive infrastructurally. So uh, people are starting to realize that maybe some of them have tried and failed. Maybe some of them um, just realize that it's hard, it's expensive, and actually they just want to focus on the product. 
And so the SDK unlocks a lot of that potential and it enables people um, to subsidize that cost, that infrastructure cost, because they're building on top of something that already exists. Yeah, I, I think the SDK is really fascinating because it kind of, you know, when you first start learning about Enzyme, it seems like a pretty neat, uh, you know, af active asset management protocol. But then like with the SDK, it, it kind of now Enzyme is kind of like your base layer for any, you know, investment strategy you want to do, including passive, which I think is really uh, fascinating. I think it's more than just strategies, you know, it's building an application on top of it, a different use case. And I think, you know, what the SDK does is extend potentially the use cases beyond just funds and indexes to much, much more. Um, and uh, we like to sometimes describe the SDK as, as more of an operating system. Yes, Give very that. cool. Definitely. Yeah, no, for sure. I, <laughs> it, It's very fascinating. Uh, let's kind of move on to the next section. I want to talk more about the roadmap. So obviously, I wrote this report in December. It's now April. I'm sure a couple stuff has happened since then. Uh, you, you touched upon it briefly about like V5 and stuff like that. Can you give me kind of like the brief rundown of what to expect from Enzyme for the rest of the year? Yeah, so I think for the rest of this year, we're mostly focused on more integrations, um, improving the user experience, things like automating uh, trading um, uh, strategies, so rebalancing strategies, etc. cetera. Um, and then kind of towards Q, end of Q3, beginning of Q4, we'll likely... Um, Sorry, second half of this year, we'll probably start working towards a V5. So research has already begun on the V5. We've aggregated all the user feedback um, that we've had. We've prioritized, you know, where where the, you know, the biggest gaps are in features according to feedback. We're very aware. We have like a sort of heat map of where where the gaps are and and what are the highest priorities. And um, we haven't laid out the exact roadmap for uh, V5 yet, but we have a pretty good idea. Um, and the biggest feature will be opening up the asset universe uh, to become a lot, uh, to yeah, to, to, to be a lot potentially larger and be able to handle lots of different types of assets going forward. In like five, 10 years from now, like what, what's the end goal for Enzyme? Like what is the big picture future? I think, you know, uh, transitioning asset management on chain uh, is the big goal um, with security and transparency. I think, you know, like we start, you know, we've we've seen the beginnings of that with crypto, crypto native funds, etc. Um, but it's inevitable that more and more real world assets get tokenized. And five, 10 years from now, it's completely fathomable that we see that exact same Franklin Templeton fund tokenized um, on Enzyme with all the underlying assets being digital as well, rather than just having a standard traditional vehicle that's tokenized. Um, and the benefits of that is the operational efficiency that you will achieve by doing that is insane. You'll be able to reduce your cost base um, substantially, and therefore you'll be able to bring down fees to investors. And I think that that um, automation aspect is is really large and really, really underappreciated, especially um, when institutions, you know, uh, you know, maybe sometimes don't appreciate uh, DeFi as much as I, I think they should be paying attention. Awesome. Very cool. So like, let's say 10 years from now, you know, I just get my, I just got my paycheck and, you know, I'm going to go put somebody in my 401k, you know, and I buy some ETF, let's say like, is it possible that one day I'll be that ETF is an enzyme vault and I wouldn't even realize, is that like a possible future that you see occurring? Oh yeah. I think that future is much closer than five to 10 years actually. Five to 10. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I mean, I would definitely, <laughs> I hope that future is soon. Like I would, that would be awesome. I think there's, I, there's so much cool stuff you can do at DeFi and that's just not possible to try my world. And Enzyme is definitely pushing that barrier of what's possible and, you know, bridging the two worlds in a way that I think is going to happen eventually. And hopefully, like you said, happen sooner than five to 10 years for sure. Uh, so that's kind of all the questions I had. Is there anything else you wanted to touch upon that, that we didn't get to? Uh, no, I think you covered a lot really well. Um, happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, I've been seeing some questions in the chat. Uh, one thing that I saw was that obviously they said fees are high, fees are high on Ethereum. You guys have also deployed on Polygon. Are there any plans to deploy on any other chains, I guess? Would it be a good question? Um, so we're mindful about deployments uh, because uh, on other chains because um, we did deploy to Polygon. Um, a lot of people said, you know, please deploy to Polygon and then um, the, the actual, the, the, the demand remains highest on Ethereum. 
Um, and uh, every time we deploy on a chain, the deployment part is easy, but the maintenance uh, around it, because you know, Enzyme is, um, it, it, you know, it, it's a, it's not a, you know, it, it's a, it's a complicated protocol with a lot of infrastructure behind it. It has seven subgraphs. It has the chain link oracle. It has all the derivative price feeds. It has a lot of things that go with it and that need to be maintained. And, um, you know, I think that in order to deploy on more chains, we need to really see the business case, the the usage uh, to justify that, that additional maintenance. Um, however, one thing that we are keeping uh, a really um, uh, close eye on is is uh, kind of this interchain uh, operability idea um, and what that potentially opens up to us, probably not for a V5, but maybe for a V6 in terms of being able to trade cross-chain from within a vault. Um, and I think it's still a little bit early to commit to that, but it's something that we're keeping an eye on researching uh, very closely and um, and I think that might be a more likely path forward than deploying on many other chains. Interesting. What about like Ethereum L2s and stuff like that? Do you see any future for Enzyme on one of those? Yeah, possibly. Uh, yeah, possibly. Again, like it would have to be demand driven. Mm -hmm. Definitely for sure. I mean, obviously most of the liquidity in DeFi is still on Ethereum. So I definitely think you guys are in the right place. Um, Let's see, any other questions that I saw in the chat? Uh, we'll start wrapping this up, but I think one other question that I saw is, you know, what is the benefit of like institutions using Enzyme? We definitely touched upon that a lot, but like let, let's hear like your your elevator speech for why uh, an institution should use Enzyme. I think the configurability that we have caters very well to the institutional use case. So being able to create a walled garden, for example, where you're only trading with uh, known parties as possible, having the operational robustness to delegate trading within an organization, knowing that smart contracts will enforce um, against bad behaviors. That is not today possible in any other um, tool uh, that I know of. And it's not possible because the tools don't have knowledge of on-chain price. So there's always edge cases and ways that people can extract value out of that, um, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. And last but not least, there's, um, you know, inbuilt tools for um, compliance and transparency. So compliance, like, you know, if you want to um, KYC your investors, you can create an allowed list. If you want to um, adhere to your local regs or whatever, you can build, you can automate those rules by just adding a policy. If you want to, you um, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, any, any, basically anything you want to do, uh, compliance wise is, is codable. And then last but not least, the transparency, the reporting, you know, it's, it's delivered to you, um, with institutional grade APIs, which can be linked to, um, your, if you do CFI and DeFi, for example, and you need to aggregate the data, you can take our APIs and link that to, uh, the reporting of the rest of your fund, or if you, um, you know, work with an accountant, you can give them access to the APIs. So there's just a lot of tooling being built around Enzyme today that um, will help bridge it to toward institutional use case more and more going forward. Very cool. Uh, if I want to learn more about Enzyme, I want to follow you. Where Where's the best place to go? You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, I think it's at Enzyme Finance. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to uh, the team. If you have any questions on the institutional side, uh, you can re reach us um, at Avangard Phi on Twitter or, or be directed to us from Enzyme. And um, yeah, any you know the team's always there to help. So we're, we're um, happy to discuss with anyone. Awesome. As for Bizarre, you guys can always follow us on Twitter at Bizarre Crypto. If you want to see this report, it is live on Bizarre website under Enzyme Research for all to see. It's free. So I highly encourage anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about Enzyme to go check it out. I think it's a really great product. You guys have built something really cool and more people need to learn about it. Great. Thanks uh, for having us. No, no. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I had an absolute pleasure talking to you. It was, it was awesome to learn more about the in and outs of Enzyme even more so that just what the report goes over and kind of, you know, hear it from the creator. So uh, this was great. Uh, I learned a lot and I hope everyone viewing at home enjoyed.